Good morning. Um, I guess if you had to pick two words or four words to describe yourself, those aren't, those aren't bad. I can think of four, many, many other four word combinations that I've heard uh, people use to describe me. So uh, I want to thank Reed for sticking to flattering words. Uh, I want to welcome you guys to Detroit. Um, uh, I understand that most of the people here uh, are not from, uh, not only not from Detroit, but not uh, from this country. Uh, your visitors from abroad, uh, and this is a really great uh, and interesting time for you to have chosen to come here uh, to Detroit. I don't know if you've been outside yet this morning, uh, but today is opening day here in Detroit, which uh, I always describe as a national holiday uh, here in Detroit. Uh, most people I know take the day off. Uh, they start very early with uh, drinking and revelry uh, before the game. Uh, I have occasionally been part of uh, the bad behavior that goes on uh, during opening day here in Detroit. I live right downtown here uh, near the ballpark, and so I woke up this morning to a, a parking lot and, and park full of people. Um, but it's, it's sort of an appropriate uh, time for you to visit, too, because uh, there is no day in baseball, of course, that's more hopeful than opening day because your record is perfect, uh, and it <laughs> certainly won't stay that way uh, through 162 games. And I, I think that's an act that's actually a really great analogy uh, for the city of Detroit. That idea of hope. Um, there is always hope, um, and there is never more hope than there is uh, on, on opening day. So welcome to Detroit, and I hope you, uh, I hope you have a great stay here. I'm going to talk. Uh, I'm going to talk a little about the city from my perspective. Uh, I uh, I am a native here, uh, grew up here, and uh, went to college nearby. Somebody who also left though for 15 years and then came back. Uh, I'm going to talk about what uh, what has changed in the city over that time, um, and then I'm going to show you a short film about. Uh, about sort of a very personal part of the city's change that uh, I've come across and come to, to really interact with uh, in a different way and then talk about uh, what, I think, uh, what I think is ahead of us here in Detroit. Um, uh, I'm going to start with uh, 1970, which is the year that I was born, right here in the city of uh, Detroit. Um, in 1970, Detroit had about 1.5 million people, um, and there are 141 square miles here in Detroit. Um, and I can remember as a kid in the early 70s, uh, this be seeming to me like a giant city. There were people everywhere. There were families uh, in, in houses. Uh, neighborhoods were overflowing with people downtown right here. This hotel uh, was still one of the sort of premier uh, uh, spots in downtown and uh, an attractor. I mean, people from all over the world would come and stay here. Of course, it is again now, but if you had come here 20 years ago, this building, this room would, would have been full of pigeons and uh, the, the walls would have been open and the windows would have been open. Uh, it was abandoned for a long time. But back to 1970 when uh, we had 1.5 million people and we had hundreds of thousands of uh, jobs here in the city, mostly to do with the auto industry. People either, when I was a kid, your parents either worked for one of the Detroit auto companies or they worked for a manufacturer. They worked uh, for a tool and die shop. They worked for an assembly uh, plant. They worked for a place that painted cars or uh, they worked for a place that made the tools that made the cars. Uh, and of course this is a city that grew up around that, that very proud manufacturing uh, base and heritage. That's what built the city to that size. Uh, and at, at its peak, it was about 2 million people. Uh, by the time I was born in 1970, it had started to lose population and started to lose jobs because of deindustrialization and lots of policy uh, here in the United States that encouraged people to leave the cities and move uh, to the suburbs. And so, uh, as much as my earliest memories of the city are quite fond and of density and 
uh, an activity, much of my life in the city is the story of decline. Um, by the time, by the time I came back to the city in 2007, uh, after having been gone for uh, for a, a good long time, working at newspapers in other cities, uh, the population was somewhere around 700,000. Uh, and the, the jobs, the hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs, auto jobs, really had started to dissipate, uh, and and there was a much different there was a much different city. I was working in Washington D.C. in 2007 as a reporter who was covering the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, and I decided to come home to Detroit because because it was home. Uh, I decided to come home to Detroit because uh, I felt uh, that my work would matter more here than it did uh, in Washington, matter more to me, uh, but potentially matter more to the city. And I remember when I told people uh, in Washington that I was moving home to Detroit, I mean, the look on their face, it was like they'd seen a ghost. Um, uh, No one could believe it. No one could fathom uh, that you'd leave Washington, which is, you know, a city with its own problems, by the way, uh, and not a garden spot, but uh, a city that was uh, much more intact than the city of Detroit. And one of the people who gave me that look, in fact, was my mother, uh, who <laughs> I said, uh, you know, we're going to move the, we're going to move home to Detroit. And I'm going to raise my kids there, just like you raised me and my sister there. And she said. Uh, you must be crazy. Uh, the city is not the same place that it was, and uh, I am not just upset that you would do it. I'm fearful uh, that you would do that. I'm fearful for what would happen to you and the children. Um, and so uh, the city had changed really profoundly uh, over that time. And of course, we didn't even know in 2007 what was ahead of us uh, in Detroit in terms of in terms of difficulty. Uh, that 700,000 people in 141 uh, square miles creates problems of space and infrastructure. Uh, the two things that uh, the two words that you guys have put together, infrastructure, space. I'm sort of pulling apart here and want to talk about them a little differently. Um, let's first talk about space. Uh, when you have 700,000 people in a city that was built for 2 million, uh, there is a lot more space. Uh, in general, uh, uh, neighborhoods that used to be packed full of houses are now uh, sort of speckled with houses. Uh, there are entire blocks that maybe had 20 or 30 houses on them that might have one or two uh, today. Uh, you can drive the main thoroughfares of the city, Woodward and Gratiot and Michigan Avenue that go out uh, toward the suburbs. When I was a kid, uh, they were dense with businesses and activity. Uh, Now those businesses are all gone uh, and there are lots of empty buildings. At at the peak, uh, our our, uh, sort of dynamic of space here Um, had about 300,000 dwellings in the city, 300,000 houses. Uh, By 2007, we had 70,000 of those structures that were empty, Uh, empty and abandoned, mostly in the hands (coughs) either of the government uh, or of uh, private owners who were not taking uh, care of them. In some ways, uh, you could see that space as opportunity, right? Uh, this was a really dense, crowded city uh, with, with not a lot of personal space for people. Uh, perhaps uh, a rethink of Detroit could have produced uh, a place where we all had a little more room, uh, where we didn't feel as much on top of each other. Unfortunately, uh, the reasons that that space opened up uh, sort of were, were tied to a sense of abandonment and disinvestment here uh, in the city that made it impossible for us to rethink uh, as that was happening. Uh, so we, by the, by the late 2000s, uh, were the victims of 
40 or 50 years of what I call unmanaged decline. Uh, people leaving the city uh, at, at, record, at record pace, jobs following them, uh, and the government unable or uh, unwilling to sort of make the kind of changes that needed to be made to make the city livable, uh, even as a much smaller entity than it was before. Um, space, of course, also really relates to infrastructure. Uh, a city of two million people uh, had an incredible number of streets. It had an incredible uh, number of miles of pipeline for sewers and water. Uh, it had an incredible number of street lights uh, and power lines. Um, and so as the space opened up, uh, the care for that infrastructure also became an issue because of that unmanaged decline. Uh, Woodward Avenue, which is just a few blocks from here east, was the first mile of paved road here in uh, the United States. But uh, if you walk around the city now or drive around the city now, the many, many paved roads that we have uh, are in some of the worst condition anywhere uh, in this country. Why? Because uh, we have not been able to maintain the infrastructure as uh, the population and the tax base have shrunk uh, here to, to levels that, uh, uh, that uh, mimic uh, much, poorer, much poorer places in the world. Uh, street lights. <clears throat> I spent a long time when I got back in 2007, uh, I, moved, uh, I moved to an apartment that was not far from uh, the place that I had lived for a really long time as a kid here in Detroit, in uh, an area not, not too far from Lafayette Park, which is this wonderful uh, development uh, based on the architectural work of Mies van der Rohe. Uh, wonderful space here uh, in the city. But when I moved home, uh, at night, when I would get home uh, from work, I'd walk from the garage to the apartment building, and there were no lights. Uh, it would be dark. It would be dark like a country road, uh, walking from the garage to the apartment building. Why? Because we had, we had 88,000 street lights in the city of Detroit when there were 2 million people. By 2007, 44,000 of them were were not working. They were not working not because the bulbs had burned out, but because, again, the infrastructure that maintains uh, that lighting system had not been cared for, had not been uh, maintained, and so uh, the city was dark. I wrote a lot about the darkness, uh, the literal darkness that we all wandered around in <coughs> um, at night, and the sort of metaphorical darkness that uh, that, that represented. Uh, that, that we were lost and that uh, we didn't understand how to get back to a brighter future. Of course, this all leads up to uh, the actual sort of low point in, in, in my judgment of, of Detroit's municipal history, which was the bankruptcy. Um, in 2013, uh, Detroit filed for bankruptcy the way any corporation that couldn't pay its debts uh, would seek protection uh, in a federal court. And the numbers that, that drove that bankruptcy are really just uh, staggering. Um, our our, our uh, revenue, our asset to, to, to debt ratio uh, at that time was 1 to 33. Uh, so in other words, if you could take all the assets we had here in the city of Detroit and sell them 33 times, you would come up with enough money to pay the debts that we had uh, that we had run up at that point. And who was that debt to? Some of it, was, of course, was to banks who we had borrowed from, not just for infrastructure, uh, but also for operations. Uh, the city, for a very long time, decided that uh, to, to, to balance the books, uh, it was a good idea to go out and borrow money uh, uh, to, to, to keep things running. Um, uh, a lot of that money was owed to pensioners. Uh, we have, uh, we have 20,000 20, uh, people who used to work for the city of Detroit 
who are retired, who draw pensions, and who, uh, who we provide health care for. We only have 11,000 people who work for the city of Detroit. So it's almost double the number of retirees. Uh, and of course, the city made uh, very good promises to those uh, people when they were employees about what their retirement would look like, but we didn't invest uh, in the funds that would, that would pay for that. So uh, we owed uh, about $6 billion. We were about $6 billion in arrearages uh, to pension and health care at that time. And so there really was no alternative. I mean, uh, the, the, the literal uh, word broke applied to the city of Detroit in a way uh, that it had never applied to a major city before. And so we did uh, go through a process of trying to, to sort of re-engineer city government so that it could live within its means, so that it could provide the services that people need, uh, so that we could get back to that balance of infrastructure and space that makes uh, a city actually work. Um, so uh, that's, that's sort of a, a, a recap of uh, the way that I see Detroit as a journalist. Uh, and I spend every day sort of thinking about these issues and thinking about these problems and thinking about what government is trying to do to get us to a, to a, different, uh, to, to get us to a different place. But I'm also, as I said, a native Detroiter. Uh, I was born here, and I'm somebody who lives here and is trying to raise a family uh, in the city, which is uh, an incredible challenge. Uh, when I lived in uh, other cities, Chicago or Baltimore or uh, Washington, uh, a lot of the things that I deal with every day here are questions about, uh, again, how you just manage your life. Is it going to be dark on the walk from the garage to the apartment building? Where will my children go to school? Uh, those questions uh, resonate much more strongly here uh, than they did in other places. Um, but this has become an even more personal um, uh, story for me uh, in, the, in the, the years after the bankruptcy because the house uh, where, where my family lived, where I was born, which uh, was on the west side of the city here, once a really thriving community that was supported by a few auto plants and uh, some, some suppliers uh, has become uh, something of uh, just a wasteland. I mean, people are gone, businesses are gone, support is, is gone, and infrastructure and space, uh, that balance uh, that, that we are trying to strike has gone really bad. Uh, I first noticed uh, that, I, that I was going to be more interested in uh, this house in uh, 2012. Actually, it was a year before the bankruptcy. This is the house where, uh, again, my family lived when I was born. And my father lived there until uh, he died in the mid-1980s. And so uh, for me, it's always been sort of a touchstone. And one of the first places I went, in fact, when I got back in 2007, uh, was to go drive by the old house and drive through the old neighborhood and see what had, uh, what had become of it. And in 2007, when I drove by, the house was in good shape. Uh, in fact, it was in really good shape. Uh, to, it's, a, it's a duplex, uh, up and down, uh, two apartment building. And uh, there was a nice garden out front, and the walk was uh, in good shape, and it was clear that there were families living there. And I would go back every so often just to check on it or uh, just, to, just to sort of reconnect with uh, where I was from. And in 2012, uh, I drove by uh, in, the, in the early part of the year, and I saw a board in the window of the first floor apartment living room. And I stopped uh, and sat there sort of just staring at it and thinking, well, what's going on? And I left and came back a, f a few weeks later, and there were more boards. Uh, and eventually the whole house, all of the windows were boarded up. And then the door to the house disappeared. And then all the windows uh, disappeared and all the boards in the windows disappeared. And so this place um, that, that uh, I had such a deep connection with uh, became, uh, became part of the narrative 
of the city that uh, that I was writing about. Um, and uh, there's uh, an incredible sort of personal journey that's taken place uh, there. But again, I, the importance of it, I think, is how it fits into that larger narrative of what we're doing uh, here in Detroit uh, and brings into the picture and into the discussion the future of the people of Detroit. This is a neighborhood where there are people who still live there. Some of them have been there as long as I've been alive and remember me and my family. Uh, but their lives look really different now than they did a long time ago. So I want to show a short film about uh, about this house and uh, my connection to it, and then I'm going to talk just a little more about where I think we're headed and connect this infrastructure and space uh, question uh, to some more important questions about people here in the city. When I was born in November of 1970, my family lived on the west side of Detroit in the second story flat of a house on Tuxedo near Grand River and Livernois. It was the first place I knew as home. It was the last place I ever saw my father alive. This is what it looks like today. Until recently, it was being cared for, but when I went back last year, I found it like this. No door, no windows, open to the elements. Every memory of my father is ensconced inside. And like the structure itself, those memories now present me with a choice. Face up to your past, or walk away. It's clear that whoever walked away from the house last, left in a hurry. The Christmas lights still dangling from the eaves of the brick tutor suggest purpose and attachment. They suggest celebration, and that someone had reason to celebrate in this house not so long ago. It's only been about a year since the house was empty. When we lived here as a family, my mother found purpose in these stairs, which were then hardwood and required regular polishing. Even in the summer of 1970, while she was pregnant with me, she cleaned them with a bucket and a scrub brush every week. She had a one-word answer when I asked why. Pride. As an infant, I spent mornings in this kitchen, in a high chair that sat in the center of the room where the sunlight could hit my face. My poodle, Oliver, was usually close by, licking the spoon I'd dangle in front of him. The nanny would turn the television to Captain Kangaroo as my parents went off to work. My parents divorced not long after my sister was born, but she and I still spent weekends with my dad at what had become his house. In the living room, he and I watched baseball and built toy trains. And the paths through the molded carpeting on the floor became roads for my toy cars, rivers for my boats, and tracks for my steam engines. My father's record collection, and yes, they were vinyl, filled three long shelves on the dining room wall. He'd play them all day and night on a turntable that sat nearby. When the records weren't playing, the radio was. It was all jazz. Miles Davis, Grover Washington, Donald Byrd. In his world, and ours, there was no other music. My dad once told us that he'd captured Santa Claus coming down the chimney, and he'd hidden him in the hallway linen closet. Santa needed a break, he said. He was under a lot of pressure. Of course, my sister and I believed. We heeded the warning not to open the door. Santa might get out and go back to the North Pole. My father lived in the house in the 7100 block of Tuxedo the entire time he lived in Michigan. The Parkers lived in the first floor flat and were more than landlords. They were his closest friends and my godparents. My relationship with them and him was defined by time spent in that house. From my early Christmas memories, through my parents' divorce, and through the drinking and smoking that led to my father's stroke and eventual death, the house on Tuxedo was the constant. The last time I saw him alive was there, just before New Year's Eve, 1984. It's hard to see the house now, to see the state it's in, and not think that it is somehow mirroring the trajectory of my father's life. And what should I do? If I let the house go, let it sit there and rot, would I effectively be allowing the last physical connection with my father to be destroyed? 
Or would letting the house go, like similar empty structures in the neighborhood and the city, be crucial to the future of the Detroit that I'm raising my children in? I was born here in 1970, and all the opportunity in the world began to unfold for me in this house. But now what's left is faded and tattered, and opportunity seems the last thing that might emanate from the walls of my old house. The dreams of my parents have melted into the nightmares of a city that can't solve its biggest problems, much less those of a single residence on the west side. Over the past 10 years, this part of the west side of Detroit has lost about 35% of its population. It's a post-white flight exodus that's carrying anyone who can afford it out of the neighborhood and likely out of the city. Some of the block looks like the house next door to my father's old house. It has likely lost its chance for rebirth. You could buy any house on this block for less than the price of a new Ford. But in a city that suffers such deep abandonment, this is hardly the worst area. It's part of the vast middle, neither solid nor completely written off. It could be years or a decade before city government decides what to do. Dave Bing ain't shit, says Les Thomas, sitting on the right. He's been on the 7100 block of Tuxedo most of his life and has seen the city deteriorate around it and throughout it. He says Detroit's mayor should go back to playing basketball. Nothing is better on Tuxedo. The only changes are for the worst. Marion Small has lived here since she was born, just a year before I was. She remembers my father and wishes the city would tear down the worst houses on the block. She also hopes someone might save my old house. She asks whether that someone might be me. I tell her that like the city, I'm torn. The Parkers still own the house, and their names are still on the deed, but it's their granddaughter who had been managing it as a rental before it went empty. Taxes are delinquent, though, and the city is about ready to foreclose. That could be my chance to intervene, but to what end? What's left to invest in? On nearby Livernoy, once a thriving commercial corridor, some buildings have literally fallen into the street leaving open facades that look like they've been shelled. The barbershop on the first floor was a hangout for my dad 30 years ago. Now, it's nothing. But there is also real life left in some corners of that neighborhood. St. Cecilia's Gym, where basketball greats like Magic Johnson and the Fab Five all came to play once upon a time, still stands as a beacon for young people in search of hope. So does St. Cecilia Church and the school and other institutions that just won't quit. And there's still life on Tuxedo. There's laughter and silliness, even in the shadow of rot and decay. An August Sunday brings remaining residents out to soak up the good weather and each other's hospitality. My father is gone, and his old house is now in shambles. But I can honor them both by refusing to turn my back. Thank you. Um, so uh, at the end there, I say I won't turn my back. Uh, I shot most of the photos uh, in that essay in the fall of 2012, uh, about six months after I found the house the, the way it appears in the film. Uh, and I put words and pictures together like this in the spring of 2013. Uh, you, you hear the reference uh, to Dave Bing being the mayor. That's how old this is now. We've got a new mayor. Mike Duggan is, uh, is now our mayor. Um, uh, it, a lot has happened uh, since I shot these pictures and made this film. Um, a lot has happened in the city. A lot has happened with that project. Uh, and I want to talk quickly now just about um, what has changed for me and, and the sense of the city because of this project. Uh, I've decided to take the house uh, and I've got a grant to redo it and to create a professorship at a local college, uh, an English professorship. Uh, we're going to make the, the house into a writer's residence. Uh, in that neighborhood, the professor will live there, teach at the college, and run a literary center uh, in the house. 
uh, I, I've also raised enough money now to take uh, take care of the rest of the block. That block, uh, there are about 30 houses on that block. 15 of them are abandoned uh, or in this kind of condition. So we're going to take all of those. There, some of them are houses. Some of them are now just vacant lots. We're going to uh, we're going to redo all of them or tear them down um, uh, in conjunction with the city. Um, and we're going to we're going to start rethinking um, uh, the infrastructure and the space of that block. What can it be? What can it be in a city that's lost as much population as this has? What can it be in a city that still, even despite the bankruptcy, uh, does not have uh, like gobs of money uh, sitting around to, to, deal with, uh, to deal with issues like this? But the really important part of this project and the thing that's become most important to me is the people that you see in that uh, film, uh, the, the, the people who live on that block, uh, I've reconnected uh, with with many of them over these last four years and begun to talk to them about their neighborhood and what's happened and the city. Um, and it's become super important in my project to empower them to decide what happens there. I mean, the truth is, I have a connection to that block because I was born in that house. I feel very strongly about it. I feel very strongly about the neighborhood, but it's not my neighborhood. I live down here now. Uh, they live in that neighborhood, and uh, this is one of the things that I think is emerging as a very important narrative here in Detroit, which is the people who live here, the people who have uh, endured all of the decline, the people uh, who live in neighborhoods like this where... Uh, that don't look like downtown and don't have stadiums and, and things like that have got to be able uh, not just to stay. Uh, you know, there's this question of, of gentrification and displacement. Uh, but beyond that, uh, they have to be able to decide for themselves what their neighborhoods are going to be, what the space, what the infrastructure is going to look and feel like in the place where they live. And so this project that for me starts with my dad and this house uh, and this idea of, of responsibility to it has now morphed into the idea of how do you, how do you organize uh, uh, people in a, in a space like this or give them the power to organize themselves to decide uh, what the future should look like. Um, that's a really important question here in the city of Detroit right now. Uh, it's an important question because of economics, uh, the, the deep poverty here in the city, uh, the imbalance uh, that you see between neighborhoods like this and, and the, the things that are going on down here that are really exciting. It's also important because of race. Uh, uh, this is a city that, uh, since I was born, when I was born in 1970, the city was still 55% white. By the time I was five years old, uh, it was 55% black. Uh, by the time I was a teenager, it was 65, 75% black. Today, it's 85 or 87% African American. Uh, and uh, black people uh, have endured the decline of this city more than anyone else. And so it's super important now that we uh, maintain the opportunity to rethink this city uh, in the context of those people. Uh, what do they? What do they deserve? What do they want? Uh, and how can how can we help them uh, get to that space? Um, the um, it, this is this is the kind of work that. Um, that's, it, it's, first of all, really different than what I do every day, of course. Uh, you know, I'm a writer. I'm not, uh, I'm not a developer. I'm not a city planner. Um, I'm certainly not a community organizer. But it's become a central part of my work, the, the, the thinking about this project, the thinking about this neighborhood, and how it relates to these other narratives that we have in the city about the future. Um, uh, it's really changed the way that uh, that I think and write about it, and the way that I do my job here uh, here in the city. And so, um, uh, you know, I, I get asked the question. I get asked more more often than anything else 
is, uh, is whether I'm hopeful uh, and whether I'm optimistic about, uh, about Detroit after 46 years uh, of being in and around it. Um, and I always answer that question uh, through the lens now of, of that block and the people on it. Um, and I, th I think there are reasons to be hopeful. Uh, there are opportunities to rethink the things that have gone wrong and the things that are not working for people here. But I do think that that optimism requires uh, a sense of responsibility and reality and action, and that uh, those of us who are here, as well as those people who are not here, uh, we always need help from the outside. We've got to start not just thinking and talking about what can be different, but doing what we can uh, to help make that difference uh, come to pass for people in neighborhoods like that. So uh, with that, I will be happy to take any questions that you guys have.